can I sympathise with Lukaku? Mm. Welcome to the first edition of One to One with Simon Jordan in 2022. During the break, I've been inundated with questions, so let's get to them. But don't forget to leave your questions for next week in the comment section below. And remember to like and subscribe. Um, the Lukaku situation is a conundrum for anyone to deal with it because it comes out of left field. You'd like to think that your star striker, the person that you really extended all the courtesy in the world to get through the door, brought back to an environment where he once wasn't overly successful in, to give him an opportunity to be successful, wouldn't behave in this fashion. What I would do if I was the owner is I'd want to leave it to the manager. First of all, I'd want to ask the manager why it's happened, and then I'd want to make sure that he was in control of the situation. Consequences are part and parcel of people's behaviour, so I'd expect him to be consequenced but I'd expect him to be brought back into the fold, have his mind concentrated and get on with the business of what he was brought for in the first place, which was to score goals for Chelsea. There's an arrogance, an unnecessary conceit about certain players' mentality. Players have got a right to have a view, but that view should have been expressed to the manager. So as the owner, I'd like to think my guy, in this instance, Tommy Tuchel, would be able to deal with this particular player, deal with him in such a fashion that was beneficial to Chelsea Football Club and not for the media. Can I sympathise with Lukaku? Mm, the narrative that's been spun up is that he came back to Chelsea because he was desperate to come back to Chelsea. And somehow things get lost in translation because he wasn't desperate to come back with Chelsea. He was quite happy at Inter Milan with Conte. Conte left Inter Milan because he was told he had to sell his best players to meet the financial obligations that Inter Milan had. And that best player was, of course, Romelu Lukaku for the best part of 100 million quid for Chelsea. So in that instance, I can empathise with him, not sympathise. But to suggest that somehow he can superimpose his views and get carried away in an interview with Sky Italy talking about A, a love letter back to Inter Milan, which if you want to do that, that's up to you. But B, more importantly, how the manager picks a team, that troubles me more than his love letter back to Inter Milan. So whilst I understand that not everything in the garden of someone like Romelu Lukaku will always be roses, to suggest that he needs sympathy because A, things aren't going his way, and B, once upon a time he had a nice time in Italy, is stretching a bit for me. Klopp and his assistants are very strong in a technical area, and there's something about that that I quite like, because you're supposed to be strong, you're supposed to be a leader, you're supposed to push it, and it's up to the authorities to put you back in your, in your, in your, in your particular place. So I'd like to see if the referees and the fourth officials think that Klopp is pushing his chest out a little bit too far and getting a little bit too, too much into the alpha male territory, then it's, in, it's upon them to deal with him. Um, it's his job to do what he thinks he needs to do to get what he needs to get from his team. If I'm an opposing manager, I'd want to get right in his face, although the argument was made that Arteta tried that and all he did was embolden the Liverpool crowd. So I'd like to think the officials would grow a pair and if Klopp pushes it, they deal with him. When he steps out of a technical area and goes on the pitch and starts challenging referees, I'd like to see the referees deal with him. They either think that he's going too far or they don't. And if they don't, it's a non-story then, isn't it? Well, how, how can Real Madrid afford a player? Or more likely, how can Barcelona, given the one Barcelona who had meltdown? The challenges that Real Madrid and Barcelona have had, and if you want to focus on Real Madrid, is the, is the governance of their league. Their, Chief executive is a guy called Javier Tevez who wants to push the Spanish league into a position where it can compete with Middle Eastern ownership. So with that in mind, he's trying to get some controls into Spanish football to be able to make sure that it can be either used as an example for other leagues to be forced to follow or to give some sort of governance in place that football desperately needs. So Madrid have been sort of stopped in their tracks and so have Barcelona by the reduction in uh, the amount of money they can spend on wages that was once upon a time whatever they wanted and now it's 70% of their turnover. At the same time as the Covid situation in Spain, having lived there for 20 years, I'm very familiar with Spain, can tell you that the main revenue stream outside of the broadcast deals and more than the broadcast deals, which is different to the UK, is their revenue from their members. In Barcelona's case it's the socios and they have lost all that, they've lost two or three hundred million quid, so they've now got two sets of governance, a 70% turnover against, rate, against wages and the loss of revenue, so they've got no revenue to be able to offset against the expenditure. 
So whilst they can afford it because they've got inordinate amounts of money to be able to either borrow or be able to develop, they actually haven't got the landscape to do it. So then go back to the original question, how are they doing it? Well, if you're buying a player that you can put on your balance sheet at the worth that he's that you bought him for, then, then you're depreciating him over a period of time. So it, it's not the buying of players that makes you breach financial fair play, it's the wages. You buy something for a pound and put it on and have it for four years. Every year, that product will, be, will diminish by 25p. So at the end of year one, it'll be worth 75p and so on and so forth. So it's never the purchasing of players that causes you to breach financial fair plays, it's the wages. And they've got governance in place now to help the Madrids of the world and the Barcelonas of the world. So hopefully that answers your question. I think Josh Taylor has the capability of beating most people, but Terence Crawford is maybe just the exception. Difficult because Josh Crawford's got to beat Jack Cottrell. That's his next fight. It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a well titled fight, but it's the domestic fighters. Josh has cleaned up his division. There's a school of thought that says he goes up to fight Terence Crawford, but it's a hell of a risk. Um, but it gets him paid. I think it's a difficult one to call. And because of my admiration of Josh Taylor, I don't want to call it in favour of Terence Crawford. But my gut feel tells me that Terence Crawford might just be a step too far at this moment in time. So my thoughts with Josh would be, stay in your division, dominate it, build up your profile, and maybe in a year, 18 months time fight Terence Crawford, but not anytime soon. Okay, so that's it for the first show of 2022. Don't forget to give me your opinions on all things like Lukaku and leave your questions in the comment section below. And of course, to like and subscribe.